Well, good evening. Good evening. The crowd that is coming out on a Tuesday night is the real crowd. Yes. They are serious. Yes. They both said to me, uh, the people are it's just like that in the week. Let me tell you something. People who come out on a Monday night and a Tuesday night to church, they're the people who are going forward. It's really the truth. That's the core group. That's the people that's really leading the church and going forward. And I'm excited to be here. I plant churches all my life. I know how we feel to start with nothing. And I know how we feel to, to have just two, three people. Stuff like that don't intimidate me. Because the people that is there, they're important. And God got a plan for their lives. And uh, tonight something awesome is going to happen with you. Amen. Amen. I have a word for you and Angela to, uh, on the worship, during the worship that God showed me. God showed me that in the church, the two of you will be like real shepherds. You will lead the church, the people will follow you. But outside of the church, you will be like a cowboy who run around. around, 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 around. <laughs> because the people in your community is not sheep. They're like a bunch of cows. <laughs> and it's not that it's negative. It's just a hard attitude. But God's going to make you skillful and there's going to come people around you that's going to have the same skillful ministry to bring people into the kingdom. Just like a cow. Yeah. You're going to catch them, you're going to drive them on, and they're going to obey your voice. You're, you're going to talk to them about God, and that same thing that is on you is going to come on your people. And you're going to talk to them and they will kind of obediently come to church. <laughs> it's what's really going to happen. And the other thing that I want to encourage is that I really feel like you're doing the right thing by encouraging your people that they must allow the Holy Spirit to come out of them. Because that's going to be the key. That's going to be the key. That's what's going to really, really bless this church and establish this church. Amen. I'm excited to see what God's going to do here, man. I tell you, this is so awesome. Well, for those of you who Came late. Welcome. <laughs> God bless you. We're going to have a good time tonight. And all of you are going to hear God's voice tonight. And all of you are going to see visions tonight. And some of you say, this is impossible. I'm telling you, it's possible that's what's going to happen tonight. How many of you normally see visions? Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to really stir you up tonight. <laughs> And I'm excited about it. Um, what is important tonight, I, I really want you to pay attention. I'm going to try not to be long because I want to do a practical thing. You know, many years ago, just as I came into the message of grace, I was struggling with things. For me, to come into grace was really hard. I was, when I, when I came to grace, I was already, um, let me think now, I was already 13 years steep into religion. 13 years um, being bombarded with religion, um, had a, 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 a really uh, difficult, um, uh, uh, um, what's the word, really, I don't know how to put it, but it was really difficult for me to break from what I've learned and what I believe in the transition. Yeah, to be really difficult to make the transition because my beliefs were so strongly grained into my heart that I've learned in Bible school and all those kind of things. So for me, it was so hard that the guy who was teaching me grace or trying to help me, I phoned him one day and I used the F word, telling him, you can take the, the message of grace and F it up your behind. That was really my words. That's what I really did. That's how, how frustrated I was. Some of you would say, is it possible that you can do it? Thank God it is, it is, it is now almost, almost how long back. This is now like 11, 12 years ago, but now 14 years ago that I did more. No, it's 17 years ago, so feel, you can, I've changed now, so don't feel bad. I don't use that word tonight. But that's what I really told him. I told him, Arthur Mendes, you can ask him. That's what I told him. Take that message of grace and jump it up your... And I tell him, because it gave me so much trouble because the people were leaving the church, and uh, not a lot, but some were leaving the church, and people were confused, and... There was a lot of frustration and stuff like that. And I was trying to take them on this journey with me. And some of them was not willing to come with me. And it was really hard. So, so what happened is, 
is that uh, a friend of mine, I was in this religious meeting, can you believe this? In a religious meeting, in the middle of a religious meeting, a friend of mine was preaching. Now he had, he was, he's a strong prophet, he had more grace in him, and more grace for people, and stuff like that. So, so he understood some things, and he had a, a good heart when it comes to uh, loving people. So, and, and he, he's preaching, and, and he, he can really move in prophecy and signs, wonders, and miracles. I just love to do it. So he began to preach a sermon that I've probably heard ten times. He preached before, and I thought, oh, okay, all right, I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to relax, basically try to take a nap while he preached the same sermon that I've heard ten times now. And then when, the, when it's over, we're going to go into see what God's doing here. So just as I, he started to preach, the Holy Spirit came upon me and said, I want you to pay attention today. And I want you to pay attention today. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Listen, listen what he's going to say. And he used three illustrations. And he didn't even know. He used it in a completely different context of what the Holy Spirit was showing me. And he didn't even know what I was saying, what, what he was really saying. So the first thing that he used, remember in Zechariah 3, that Joshua was standing, the high priest was standing in front of the angel. And Satan was standing on his side, accusing him. And then the, the, the angel spoke and said, take your hands off from him. He is a brand saved from the fire. And he said to the people that were standing by, take the filthy clothes off from him. And give him new garments, and they put bright new clean garments on him, and a turban on his head, and everything. And and uh, 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 oh yeah, and, and, and he said, "You are not accused." So, and then he used the second illustration that he used is the prodigal son that came back from being in the world, and he came back to the father, and the father says, "Put on to him a new garment, put shoes on his feet." Give him a ring. Restore his authority. Okay. Did you know there's something very interesting about the prodigal son when he said to his father, Father, I sinned against you. The father didn't answer him. Did you see that? <laughs> because if the father answered him, then it means the solution to our problem will be confessing our sins. The Lord just let him go on where he left off. Isn't that awesome? Okay, all right. Thank you for your enthusiasm. But, and then the third thing, the third thing that he say, the third thing that he say, was Jesus standing at the door knocking, and he said, "If anybody open, I will come in." And I and I listen to this, and these three things become very clear in front of me. And the Holy Spirit said to me, "What do you see in these pictures?" And I look at it, and suddenly it dawned upon me. That the high priest didn't transform himself godly. The high priest, the high priest Joshua didn't change himself. God changed him. Did you see the prodigal son? He didn't change himself. The father changed him. Did you see the father brought the transformation? And the father put the clothes on him. The father restored him. He managed to sonship. And the third thing that, that was the, the picture of Jesus knocking on the door. And I was sitting there and I said, God, what are you saying to me? He says, this is what grace is all about. It is me starting a good work in you and I will complete it. You just rest in what I've already done for you. And when I look at the third picture that he was there, the third picture was, and I said, what does that mean? And Jesus says, you just have to come to the party. <laughs> The whole shift came because that was what I was struggling with all my life is how can I be better so that God can love me? How can I be, how can I come to a place that God can just love me more? <laughs> how can I come to a place that my behavior come to the place that God accepts me and that I'm blessed? And that was my main thing because I was always into behavior modification. My whole God said to me, Peter, I made you righteous. You cannot become more righteous. You cannot come be less righteous. I have made you righteous. Do you understand what's going on here tonight? And, and, and that was what so many Christians struggle with this because they're hard on themselves. They don't feel good enough about themselves because they don't see themselves from God's perspective and what God has done in their lives. Forget about yourself. The thing 
he's going to go to the grave. You know, Marilyn Madam, Madam Monroe was a real beautiful woman. But the night when she died, they rolled her up in a blanket, throw her in the back of a truck, and they drive her away. Good luck for being looking nice in the flesh. I'm honest to you. It's not about what is on the outside, it's what's on the inside of you. That's what I spoke about last night. That the work is not finished until you see Jesus in you. See, Jesus' part is done. He finished the work. He seated on the right hand of the Father. My part is to believe in that. And to believe is to see the image of Christ in me. The moment that I can see Christ in me, the work is done. Woohoo! Because then you begin to walk like a sun in the earth. And when the sons of God show up, this is where the authority of God is. Amen. Have you seen something about Jesus? See, you need to, you need to, there's one thing that the life that Jesus lived on the earth, we don't live that life. We live a different life. This is after the resurrection. But we, there's certain things that we see in Jesus' life that is outstanding. Like every time that we do a miraculous thing, people would drop on their knees and they would say, truly, you are the son of God. There's one thing that's outstanding about the sons of God in the earth or the daughters of God. Woman, you don't have to feel bad. We all have, in the Greek, there's no gender. You all have the same stuff. So if I talk about sonship, I don't know how we're going to look in heaven. But anyway, I don't know. I don't know who's going to be like, who's going to be woman, who's going to be men. You know, I just... I just don't care, we're going to be in the glory. Are you with me? Someone asked me that question one day. So, are we going to be like, you know, I won't go like the person. <laughs> ask me anyway. You can think out for yourself. <laughs> so. So, so, tonight I want you to pay attention for a short period of time, okay? And then we, I want to encourage you, then we're going to go into, then we're going to go into, Doing something very practical tonight. I mean, very awesome. Here's what I want to say to you. That God has the ability to make this world alive. Alright? Yes. But did you know that the early church did not have this world? Yes. Did you know that most of the things that the early church experienced was... The main thing that they had, had was Christ in them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. You must remember that Jesus made a statement and He says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit come on you, oh God, you've got to see this tonight. You will be my witnesses. What is he saying? Did he say that we will stand on the street corners and scream the gospel? Did he say we will go and talk to people? This is not what he was saying. He was saying, when the Holy Spirit come upon you, I will be revealed to you. That's what he said. You will be a witness unto me. You, me, will be a witness unto him. He will be revealed to you. See, the work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Christ in us. Woohoo! Because when that, fire, when that fire came on them, see, Jesus breathed on them, which I believe they were born again. When the Holy Spirit came on them, that which was in them was released. Yeah. And it came, that which was inside of them came upon. And it came in fire. I, I love that. Yeah. I didn't know where I was going to go with this now. But, the point that I want to make here tonight is this, is that, oh yes, this is what I want to say. The Holy Spirit, they only had the Holy Spirit and knowing that Christ was living in them. The only thing that they know is that Jesus died on the cross, He's risen from the dead, seated on the right hand of the Father. The only things that they know was the teaching of the apostles which they heard from Jesus and what they have experienced from Jesus. They did not have the, the letter, we did, they did not have the letters of Paul. It came afterwards. So they were people who were very sensitive to the voice of God. They were people who were really led by the Spirit of God every day of their lives. You would have men like, like uh, you, you know what is amazing about Philip 
and, 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 and Stephen, you see, you know what's amazing? They were just members in the church. The next moment they begin to serve the tables, and then a, 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 a moment later, you, you see something, suddenly they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Bible said they had faith, and they were filled with the Spirit of God. What really happened with these two people? What happened with these deacons? What happened with these two outstanding men? Every day they were breaking bread and serve Holy Communion to people. Every day, his body is broken for us, his blood is shed, the work is done. Every day. And as they do this, they were encouraged in themselves. They become aware of the finished work of Jesus Christ until they come to a place that they were full of faith in the Holy Spirit and God began to do miraculous things through them. Isn't that awesome? It's not their service. Some people say, oh, it's because they serve every day and that's why God anointed them. No, no, it's not. No, they every day, they saw the body of Jesus, reminded of the body of Jesus broken. Every day they were reminded of the blood of Jesus shed. And every day they come to the conclusion, it is finished. He has done it for us. And then eventually that thing hit their hearts with faith. Bang! And they were just powerful men, men of God on the earth. Isn't that awesome? I, I just enjoyed it. So I want to say to you, God can take this book and He can make it alive. God can take a scripture. You know, God gave me many scriptures in my life that He did out of this book and He made it alive. I just know God speak to me. How many of you have experienced that before? You just know God, God speak to you. But you know what? God wants to speak to you on a different level too. He wants to come to a place that you are intimately in a relationship with Him. That you know that you can hear his voice in your heart, that you can see visions. <laughs> Did you know that a picture speaks stronger than a word? Sure. Have you seen how they teach people to read languages, to study languages? Have you ever heard of Rosetta Stone? She used pictures, just like they use with little kids. Cow, cow, show them a little picture. Really? Did you know that the language of the Holy Spirit is pictures? 90% of the time, the Holy Spirit's language is pictures. 90% of the time, God speaks to me in pictures. And He gave me the interpretation of it. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Amen. How do you know that Jesus, when He was ministering to people, He says, the Father, listen to what Jesus says, the Son can do nothing unless the Father shows Him. Jesus was in tune with the Holy Spirit from the Father. The Father was speaking through the Holy Spirit to Jesus in pictures. All the time. Habakkuk got it right. He says, I will put myself, set myself on a rampart and I will see what he's saying to me. Listen to what he's saying. See what he's saying to me. God speaking, speak these pictures all the time. Visions all the time. I've seen lots of visions in my life. Hundreds of visions, thousands of visions. I prophesy over people most of the time when I prophesy over them. It's pictures that I get. Like tonight, I saw him on a horse with rounds with that thing, driving the cows and stuff. And I thought, what's that, Jesus? And then God began to show me the picture, began to interpret it to me. Did you know that God? Oh, yeah, Peter, but that is for just very special anointed people that pray 40 days in the and fast 40 days. Come on. <laughs> Listen, the gospel is simple. Can I tell you something? I told my people in the church one day, I said, you've got to relax and you've got to get off this holy, holy cow thing, this holy Joe thing that you have to pray so long, study so long before God. My people work every day from 8 to 5 or from 7 to 5. It doesn't. Some of them work nature. They arrive home. They are tired. They don't have time to read the Bible. And then if I come Sunday, they come to church, then the pastor have to tell them, oh, you've got to read your Bible. You've got to pray so much. They're tired. They work hard. They've got kids. They've got families and all kinds of stuff. But here's the thing is what I teach my church is this. I'm telling them the Holy Spirit is in you all the time and God is on all the time. Whether you are in the workplace, whether you are on the football field, whether you, or whether you are on a baseball field, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is in you all the time and He can speak to you any moment of any time. Get off that Holy Joe wagon thing and just relax and begin to understand that God is with you wherever you are. All the time. The church have put all these things. That's why we don't see power in the church. Because the people think, oh, I've got to pray so much. I've got to 
get June dream of God. I got to get God to do this. I got to, I got to really go, come to a place. Listen, you can work and be in the peace of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, I have my biggest revelation standing under the shower <laughs> in the morning. Really? My biggest revelation is when I'm standing under the shower. I'm talking to Jesus under the shower is the best time of the day. I had a lady in our church. I want to tell you this story. It's actually, it's not part of my show. It's actually really amazing. She came to our church at this age of 79. That's incredible. At the age of 80, I baptized her. She take on the word of God and she did in one year before she died more for God than Christians who were sitting 10 years in our church. Really? You know how she was baptized in the Holy Spirit? She said to me, Pastor, she said, Pastor, in our house, it's so busy, everybody, you know, it's the best place that I can spend time with the Lord. I go into the toilet and I sit there and I know they won't bother me. And she said, I don't even have a number one or a number two. I just sit there. <laughs> I'm shocking you tonight. Oh, hey, he's not going to get me back again. <laughs> and she said to me, one day, she, I, she said to me, Pastor, I would love, she phoned me, she said, I would love to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I really want you. And I said to her, you know what? You can write where you, where you spend time with the Lord, ask him, you know. And uh, so time went by Sunday, she came to church, she was so excited. She says, you know what happened? I sit in the toilet and I said, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And she said, the next moment, it was like a wave that break over me. It was not the toilet. That <laughs> a wave broke over me, she said. And she said, and I begin to speak in tongues. And God just began to use this woman. You know, the night that she died, she was three days in a coma, and the doctors phone and they say, you guys need to come and say goodbye to her, she's going to go any moment now. Listen to this. I, we stayed in her hospital room with the family there. Listen to this. She's in a coma for three days. She's busy dying. The doctor says she's going to die any moment. The next moment, she came up in her bed like this. She sat straight up like this. Her eyes closed. She quote, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's a power of salvation for everyone who believes she fell back and died. Wow. That's awesome. The presence of God filled that room. That whole family came to Jesus. That whole family. It was the most powerful event that I was ever, because she was in a coma. She was for three days. She did not wake up. She just came up. Quote that, that spirit, that word came out of her spirit. She dropped that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's a power of the salvation for everyone who believes. And everybody knew that was God. Oh, yeah. Because she was three days in the coma. Yeah. Why did I tell you this? You got to understand that inside of you is the very life of God. The spirit of God is in you. Yeah, but I'm, you don't know the mistake that I make. Who cares? God don't care. God's not intimidated by sin anymore. Come on. God got a mind problem. He got a remembering problem. The Bible says you don't remember your sins anymore. Who are you to remind him of that? Come on. Get over it, man. Oh, if you preach like that, you're going to give us a license to sin. What do you do? Go and read your Bible again. The Bible is very clear that it's the Lord that gives you the license to sin. It's the Lord that drives you to sin. Grace don't drive you to sin. The more I tell you that God got absolutely nothing against you, the more you are drawn to Him. Even in your mistakes, even if you must make mistakes, I have to tell my people every Sunday, God got absolutely nothing against you. Can I tell you why? Because it makes them fall in love with God all over. The more that they can spend time with God, the more God can change them from the inside out. Because if you have a sin conscience, you can't focus on God. If you have a sin conscience, you can't hear. See, this is what people say. You know, I say to the people the other day, you know what I say to you people here on Sundays in the church? I said, I'm going to be honest with you now. You can fire me today, but I want to tell you all in this church. I said to them, here's the reality. I say Sundays here that, that God has forgiven us all our sins, but we have to remember that there is consequences to sin. I said, it's crap. I'm not going to say it anymore. 
I said, do you know why? Because the world tell you from all over the way you go. If you drive drunk, there's consequences to it. If you murder someone, there's... I don't have to tell you there's consequences to sin. Everybody knows it. Are you with me? I said, but here's the reality. Sin paralyzes my godly desires. And sin brings condemnation in my heart so they don't hear God's voice. Amen. But what is sin? That's the question that you have to ask yourself tonight. What is sin? Is sin really the things that we do wrong? I'm not so sure about that because I study my Bible and my Bible tells me something different. Because sin in the basic basically the first thing means to miss the mark. You know what the sin? Romans 16, 17. Whatever is not of faith is sin. That's that's sin. So with other words, if I put myself under the law, I'm in sin. If I try to please God, if I try to live up to a standard, I put myself into sin. That's sin. Really? But Paul talked about the works of the flesh in Galatians. Come on now. <laughs> what is the works of the flesh? It's birth out of the law. Again, we go back to the law. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Because if you study Galatians, you will see right through the book it's a battle between law and grace. Yes. Listen, the flesh of the law is the strength of sin. Yes. Isn't that true? Yes. The law is the strength of sin. Peter, I don't believe you. Well, let me give you scripture. <laughs> Then with me, I'm going to give you two or three scriptures quickly. Can I do that? Sure. First one, Romans 3. Are you there? I'm already there. First thing that I want to say to you is, is Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. So you got that one. Then we do book 1 Corinthians 15. Are you there? Verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 15? 56. 15? Yes, 56. Can you see that? 56. Can you see that? Am I right or am I wrong? The strength of sin is the law. The law gives sin strength. The more that you are... To, see, people say, what is the law? I'm quite off my sermon now. I think the Holy Spirit wants to say something tonight. See, my, the people say, yeah, but I'm not under the law anymore. Here's the reality. Everything you try to do to get God to bless you, you put yourself under the conditions of the law. Every time you... You know what? It brings frustration. It brings annoyances to your heart. <laughs> and the next moment, that same frustration it begins to drive you into the flesh. Because you are in the flesh if you try to please God. You are in the flesh if you think through behavior modification God is going to accept you. But on the end of the day, if you look at it, Paul says that every time that Moses is read, it brings a veil on the heart. 2 Corinthians 3.15 so here's what I want to say to you tonight is, what is that that blinds the church? It's the law. Am I right or am I wrong? Now turn with me to Colossians 2. I want to show you something in Colossians 2. Well, let's just jump back first to, to Hebrews. I want to show you three scriptures in a row. I'm going to give you Hebrews 10. That's that scripture that I read last night. Remember that scripture. Hebrews 10. You remember that? Remember in Hebrews 10 verse 1. I'm going to show you something now. It's really going to bless you. Hebrews 10. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come. And not the very image. Okay. Say image. image. You're still with me in this. Turn now with me to Colossians 2. 
and we read from verse 3. Now you're going to be blessed. How many of you remember last night I said to you, to walk by faith means to see Jesus Christ in you? Remember that? Those of you who were here, now listen to this. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now listen to this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, that's the law, which was contrary to us and taken it out of the way and made it to the cross. Alright, so you got that. Now, now listen to this. Having disarmed principalities and powers, making us a spectacle of them triumphing over in it, over them in it. That's the devil, okay, the demonic forces. Verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Now listen to this. Which are a shadow. Where did we read about shadow? Hebrews 10. Which are a shadow of the things to come, but not the substance of Christ. Okay, Hebrews 10, he says that the law is the shadow of of the good things to come and not the very image. Here he says that those things is a shadow of the good things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Okay, say image. Yes. Say substance. So you agree with me that substance and image is the same thing? Am I right or am I wrong? Because that scripture is exactly the same as in Hebrews 10, but he now bring it to the reality of what the image is, the substance is of Christ. Okay, so Christ in me, this is the faith of God. So when I begin to see Christ in me, I'm walking in faith. You still with me? Now listen to this. The scripture that we call so much in faith, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of the he things, hope for the evidence of the things not seen. So what is he really saying? He's actually saying now faith is the image of Christ in you. The evidence of the things not seen. <laughs> Are you with me? So I'm just putting you right into what faith really is, is to see Christ in me. There's a difference. Faith is not only hearing, faith is also seeing. And this is what I want to do, is, is to open people that they can begin to see in the Spirit. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus is walking with his disciples. He said to them, who do you guys say I am? And say, they say, well, some say... I am, you are a prophet, others say you are a writer. He says, but who do you say I am? And Peter, for the first time in his life, says something right. <laughs> and he say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And he said that on this rock, which is in the Greek, Petra, I will build my church and the gates of hell, excuse me, he says, and I will not call you Simon anymore, but I will call you Peter, which is Petros. So a Simon, the word Simon means a reed that is pushed around with every kind of wind of doctrine, and Petros means it is a little rock, it means it's strong. He says, and on this rock, now we talk about Petra, and is referring to the revelation. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Did you know that that word hell in the Greek is Hades, and it means to be blinded? It's right up against Revelation. You can preach hell out of it, you want, but Jesus say, Jesus say that on this rock, on this revelation, that Christ is the Son of God, He says on this revelation, that Christ is dwelling in every person as the Son of God, we being created in Him, I will build my church. <laughs> Amen? And Hades, and you will not be the gates of Hades, the gates of blindness will not overpower the church. Are you with me? So the battle of Satan is to blind you. You understand? That's why he says in Colossians, he says, having wiped out the requirements that was against us, disarming principalities and powers. Can you see he's saying it in the same context? He is saying that when he took the law, and he took, did you know that Jesus became the law on the cross? They nailed the cross. Everything that the requirement that was against us was nailed to the cross. Disarmed principalities and powers. Because the only power that Satan got is to bring the law against you. He got nothing. He can't look at Jesus because Jesus is absolutely we are forgiven in him. So we have to bring another trick into the church. And the trick that he brings into the church is this. 
Hey, you know what? If you do this and do this, you will become. Yes. Yeah. You will become. You will become. <laughs> this is a becoming, becoming gospel that they preach. It's like a carrot, it's like a carrot on a stick <laughs> in front of the donkey. The, they, they take the promises. They, every time that I say to you, you have to do something to get God to bless you, I put the promises of God in the future. I'm moving you away from what Jesus has done and I bring you to a place that, 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 that now it's out of your reach. You are now in the shadow. You understand what, what's going on here? This is the only, listen to what he said to Jesus. He said, if you change this bread, ah, this stone into bread. If you are the son of God, change these stones into bread. You know what he was doing? He was doing exactly the same thing that he did with Adam and Eve. He said to Jesus, if you do, you have to do something to prove who you are. Are you with me? Yes. And Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Why did Jesus make that statement? Because just a couple of hours before, not a couple of hours, but just 30 days before that, <laughs> because Jesus was now on the end of his fast, there was a voice coming from heaven that says, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus said, I don't have to change stones into bread to prove who I am. My father told me and I believe in him. Done. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little sorry, man. Sorry. I'm, you remember? Satan? He was actually saying to Satan, you remember? You were at the Jordan River. You remember? Do you remember the voice that came? He says, I live from that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't live to prove anybody any miracle way. I'm living by the reality of what my father said to me. Yeah. Hmm. This is so powerful. Listen to what he said to Adam. He said to Adam, if you eat from that tree, he said, didn't God say, he said, he twisted so, he twisted so that, that, that he said, if you eat from that tree, man, you will be like God. They were already like God. That's why he's saying, Corinthians, make sure that you will not be deceived by Satan from the simplicity of the gospel. What, what is the simplicity of the gospel? It's done. There's nothing that you can do anymore. You've been created in the image of God. Can I tell you what is the real power of the gospel? The power of the gospel is to prove and show to you who you are in Christ. That's what I read to you last night in 2 Corinthians 4. Remember that the God of this world is blinding their minds and they cannot see the light of the gospel that is shining the image of Christ on their hearts. See, every time that we preach the finished work of Jesus Christ and every time that we preach the gospel, you know what we are doing? The light of the gospel begins to show in you who you are. See, the ultimate purpose of the message of grace is to bring you to a place that you understand. Wow. Walking with my daddy. Yes. I'm inseparable from him. Yes. I share an inheritance with the Son of God. Yes. And for a purpose on this earth, and to watch out, this purpose is going to shake the world. Yes. Come on, guys, it's time to make decisions. Amen. Really. Can I tell you something? The inclusion and the universal teaching, you know what they do? They rob you of choice. Just like Adam. Adam was robbed of choice, but Jesus came and bring choice back. Yes, yes. That's so powerful. So me and you can make a decision again. So you can choose and say, I'm going to live a mediocre life, or you can say, hey, forget about that. I'm going to install this to the faith of everything that I get, and I'm going to grab onto the Holy Spirit to reveal to me everything that Jesus has done to me, for me, excuse me, everything that Jesus has done for me. I'm going to hold on to the Holy Spirit until He has imparted in my heart, in my whole being, the full revelation of Jesus Christ because I don't want to stop where I am. I want to go into this world. I want to enjoy life, but I also want to see the power of God coming. Yes. Yes. Did you know that 20, 
Did you know that almost 27 years ago I was working in a jail every day? I went in, I locked prisoners up, cuss and swear from morning to noon, beat people up because I was an angry man. The jail was different those days in Africa. I was sitting on the weekends on the towers around the jail because those who work on the inside have to work on, on, on our second weekend shift. We have to sit in. I was sitting for eight hours with an ADD personality, attention deficit disorder personality. They locked me basically up in a tower next to the jail to watch over. It drive me nuts. It drive me nuts. I was a prisoner myself, not only in working in the jail, I was a prisoner to lots of stuff. I met Jesus <laughs> in 1983. If I have to begin to tell you what happened since 1983, we can write books. Because I've traveled the world. I was basically for seven years working in a jail. I had no desire. I hate myself. I hate the prisoners. I hate everything. I was drinking in the nights and partying. I was never an alcoholic. I was never addicted to anything. But I was a party animal. And I was an angry young man. I was came out of seven cases of assault against me. Nelson Mandela pardoned me from that. But here's, here's the reality. When I met Jesus Christ, I came on a journey that blew my mind and went beyond myself. Yes. And can I tell you something? The place where I was is worse than Pineville. People, you know what the place, you know what the place's name was? The place's name was Zonderwater. It means place without water. And it was really like that. It was in the middle of nowhere, a dead end. Can anything good come from there? Yes, God visit this man. Because he heard his cry. And God brought me out of that. And I never rested. I saw the world. I traveled Europe. I traveled South America. I traveled Africa. I traveled. I've seen miracles upon miracles. I've seen people coming yeah. to Christ. I planted the church one day in one hour. Some of you would think this is crazy. With 80 members in one hour. <laughs> in Mozambique. And do you know how it started? I was, we were on the end of the crusade going home. It was our last day there, and I walked down the street, and there was a, a lot of young men, I would say, between the age of 16 to 22. I don't know why I'm telling you these things. I just want to encourage you, but between the age of 16 and 22 was, was, was young men selling all kinds of arts and crafts that they make African art that they were selling on the street there. And I go and sit in one of the, the chairs that one of them had made. And when I sit there, he tried to begin to reason with me on prices and stuff. And as I look at him, when I look at him, Jesus speaks out of me. And I say to him, did you know that Jesus Christ loves you? Yes. You know what he said to me? He said, sir, if that is true, why do I suffer like this? And I said to him, because you never heard the true gospel. Five minutes later, later there was 20 young people sitting there, listening to the gospel. One of them a Muslim. They, they came from the tables and then they saw yes, tourists come and they say, oh, oh, hold that word and they run back to their tables. <laughs> and they sell stuff and when the tourists come, they come back, say, tell us again. Half an hour later, I led them all to the Lord, including the Muslim. Okay. It's not the end of the story, they say. You know what they say to me? The first one say to me, you are our pastor now. <laughs> I said, I can't be your pastor, it's impossible. They said, what, how are we going to hear this gospel again? I said, can you be here? Tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. Now in Africa, to tell people to be 8 o'clock at the place in the morning is very different. You ever heard of African time? <laughs> 8 o'clock the next morning when we arrived, there were more than 80 people sitting there. They brought the people out, so you have to come and listen to this man. He we think he tell the true gospel. I'm telling them about righteousness, forgiveness in Jesus, the finished work of Jesus Christ. People come to Jesus. I did that whole thing in one hour. Years before I was working in a jail, angry young man, God took me on a journey. That was incredible. Yes. I want to, I'm not saying to you, leave Pineville, but I'm telling you, you can be part of an awakening in Pineville. Seven years later, after I went through Bible school and everything, I went back and I planned the church. Sorry, it's funny that everything worked on sevens. I worked there seven years. Seven years later, 
after we have planted a, 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 another church in a community, we came to that same area where I was. Listen to this. And I planted a church seven kilometers from that jail. Seven kilometers from that jail. I planted a church. In two years, we were more than 200 people. And some of them were wardens coming to Jesus. Why am I telling you this? There's nothing different between me and you. Zero. I am not more special than anybody else. I don't have a greater anointing than you. I have the same Christ in me than what you have in you. There's no difference. We just have different callings. Yes, that is true. You agree with me on that? See, I don't really believe in stuff where people come and say, Oh, brother, you have the anointing of Elisha on you. Or you got the anointing of Joseph on you. Or you got the anointing of Joshua on you. I don't want that anointing. Because the one that anointed me is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. He told me. He told me, oh, brother, I promise you, you have the anointing of Elijah. The last guy that said that to me, I said, listen, I, don't, I don't just want to correct you here. Sorry, I don't want to burst your bubble here, but I don't want that. The guy was shocked. I said to me, here's the reality. I have the anointing of the one who was risen from the dead. Not one of them is risen from the dead. I don't want that anointing. That's right. Am I right or am I wrong? It's reality, man. So here's why I'm saying this to you. The same Christ that dwells in me dwells in you. You have just a different calling. You can't look very, you can't look down on your calling and think, oh, he got such an amazing calling, not me. Let me tell you something. You can do stuff in the kingdom of God that I cannot do. I'm not called to do it. I don't have the ability to do it. Amen? Amen. That's the body of Christ. I don't know why it is every time I begin to sing in the church, they turn the mic down. <laughs> What's the message? I'm not called to do that. I can't read praise and worship. <laughs> you with me? It's not my thing. See, here's what, I come from a back, background where my family were big talkers, we had nothing. And we were big talkers. <laughs> we were, we could ex escalate anything. You were, you, you were me. My mother was like, my dad was not like, well, my mother was like that. We all inherited that. We could take one thing and make it big. <laughs> but we had nothing. You, are you with me? So Jesus says, let's call him, Father. He will make us big. Let's give him something. But you with us. <laughs> so, and that's all that I want to do. I just want to make Jesus big. Hallelujah. See, what I love of you shall love, you shall not love by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, of that proceeds from the mouth of God. Listen to what the Message Bible says. Can I give it to you quickly? The Message Bible says this. <clears throat> it takes more then bread to stay alive, it takes a steady stream of words from the mouth of God. Ooh, I love that. A steady stream of words from the mouth of God. Listen to what David said. All right? And I love this. David, David said here, I'm only on page one. Are you ready? Five pages going. <laughs> Listen to what David said in 2 Samuel 23 verse 2. He says, God's Spirit spoke through me. Now here, I just want to tell you something. Do you agree with me? That's Old Covenant. Yeah. God's Spirit spoke through me. His words take shape on my tongue. Shoot. And He was under the Old Covenant. You are under a better covenant based on better promises. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? You want to tell me that God cannot speak through you? Don't become weird. I you know some people become weird Christians. <laughs> They're weird. They, 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 did you know that I once slapped a man in the church? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't do it here. <laughs> I was very young. I was very young. I was very young. I was still a, I was a young pastor. <laughs> and I met this. Now in Africa, we drive many demons out of people. It's, in my town alone was a thousand witches. At least a thousand witches. So you must know, Friday afternoon, 6 o'clock, they begin to eat the drugs. And they eat them straight through. If you come in the night out, if you stand outside your home, you hear the drugs in the background. They eat them 
right till Monday morning, 6 o'clock. Oh and God. they do their chants and things. But it is not something to be afraid of. Yes, be, but because of that, many people got demons. So we are used to demons, you know. Yeah. We're used to it. We cast them out of people. Hundreds of it. So, so you know, I'm in this church service. I won't say what kind of church it was. And on the end, the pastor, they had the speaker from, Af from, from America speaking there. And the pastor said, go two, three to one another and pray for one another. And here comes this guy to pray for me and my friend. So you yeah, sure, brother, you can pray for us. But I keep my eyes open when people pray. This guy pop his eyes back that you can only see the white when he pray for you. And it was just a thing that he do to impress people spiritual. But me, I didn't understand it. I thought it was a demon. So while he began to pray, I say, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. And he keep on praying. He didn't know I was talking to him because he can't see me. And I look at my friend. And there's a thing that we do. There's a thing that we do. If, a, if someone don't respond on the demonic adventure, we sometimes just slap him a little bit in the face. It's not hard. Just to, so that they can, so that they just can come to their senses again. But I felt by myself, and that was the stage that I was upset with the church. And I thought to myself, today we're going to do it good. <laughs> and this friend of mine saw what's coming and says, Peter, you're not going to do it. I said, oh yes, tonight you're going to do it. And this guy, his orange is open in the white, you see the white, and I slap him with a fivefold minister. Like I've never been. I slap him man down. Man down. He jumped off on his feet. What are you doing? I said, well, I thought it was a demon. Your eyes were white, you know. And I stand there as if, you know, as if I'm not guilty, but I was guilty, you know. So, so, so. Come on, I want to put I don't think he ever did that again. So I said, no, it's my way of praying. I said, well, it's really stupid to pray like that. I said, because according to us, many of the demon manifestations that we come up in Africa, they, are, they, they do that. They eyes pop back and you only see the white. I mean, and that's to me, that's a manifestation. He was upset. So I said, to me, that's a manifestation. Sorry, buddy. There's a lot of people now involved. It's not like one person. Now everybody's looking at this situation. Try to calm me down and I say, well, Sorry, man. <laughs> I thought it was a demon. <laughs> it's just, I, when I go, all kinds of stuff can happen. But, anyway. but can I tell you something? I want to, there's a reality check that we need in the body of Christ. You know what it is? God wants to speak to you personally. You need to understand, I'm going off my sermon tonight, I don't know why, but I say stuff. But, but you, need to, you, you need to understand tonight that if I prophesy over you, it's second-hand information. Most of the time it's confirmation of what God already said to you. But if God speaks to you personally, it's first-hand information. And you know what? We can all hear God's voice. Do you know how many times people have come out of situations just because they hear God's voice? You know, there's a man in the Bible that really blessed me. Did I told you last night about Ananias? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to skip that one. But anyway, God can guide you to a place. A friend of mine was just young in the Lord, and they went out full, full time for, for, for the Lord and lived by faith. And, and, and he was struggling financially, and he, he was really into a bad, bad, bad spot. And he, and he said, well, what are we going to do? And while he was playing, he just got this function to walk down the street and walk down to the park and he just had a vision of a specific bench that's in the bar, park to go and sit there and he walked down the street and he go and sit there still talking to God and it was like it was autumn it was uh, uh, fall and he was kicking his feet in the, in the leaves and the next moment he kicked a wallet oh. and he opened the wallet and it was full of money yeah. and as honest as he is he went to the police and he said to them hey guys I picked this up in the, in, the, in the park and the constable said to me, take it man. He said, no sir, there's somebody else. The guy said, listen, are you stupid or what? He said, no. He said, well, take the wallet and leave. <laughs> he took the wallet and he left. God let him 
God knew that that wallet was lying there. Yeah. God let him there. He was out of money. Jesus said to Peter, go and catch a fish. You will find money in his mouth. Pay the tax. Come on, guys. We think so small. God knows every little detail in this world. We are so, see, see, we are so conditioned with the world. We, we are so, we got answers in the world, we got everything in the world. But sometimes we are with our back against the wall that there is no answer in the world anymore. Guess what? There is already a miracle. God is already working behind the scenes. He already got a way out for you. Amen. We just need to become sensitive to His voice. Yes. And you know what? It is hard when you are in, hard, in a hard situation to, to, to hear God's voice. But you know what James said? James said, count it all joy when you're all kinds of... Of, uh, in all kinds of trials for it's a testing of your faith. But here's what I want to say to you. He goes on in that passage and then he say, if anybody needs wisdom, see, see the, the, the way out of your circumstances is wisdom. He said he must ask by faith <coughs> and not doubting because a man who doubts is like the wave of the sea. Are you with me? Double-minded man at the east. Now, here's a statement that I want to make to you tonight. God, do not speak unconditionally. What do I mean by that? That means that today I feel good, God speak to me. Tomorrow I'm down, I don't feel good, so God don't speak to me. You have to remember that whether you are down or you are up, God still speaks. Your down feeling don't impress God. <laughs> The way that you feel, your emotions can affect you that you don't hear His voice. But here's the reality. You can hear God's voice. Let me, let me give you a good illustration. How many of you tonight really need wisdom from God in a situation? Okay, I want to to those three, four people. You guys go sit there. The other people are okay. You don't need God. <laughs> I'm just joking. Anyway. You know what is interesting? If you go to second, I, I'm, I'm going to begin to close down now. Uh, it, it, there's five things that I want to give you that you need to look at. Can I do that? And then we, we're going to do this practical thing. Number one is your emotions. And this is what I've just talked about. That, that, that God speaks to you unconditionally. It doesn't depend on how you feel. God is always on. God always speaks. It is us. God's, like Andrew Womack says, God's transmitter is always on. It is us, the receiving end that have a problem. Is it right? Yes. So, so the first thing that you need to remember in, in, in 2 Kings 3 verse 11 to 15 that's a really interesting situation in the Bible if you look at that they were in war Israel, Israel was in trouble and here's what happened they say is the Jehoshaphat our Jehoshaphat asked and says is there any king here are any prophet here that we can get a word from God and because it was him and the king of Israel so they say well Elisha is still out so they went to Elisha and if you read that passage, you know what is interesting about that passage? Elisha was ticked off. He was really upset with them. Because Elisha speak to the king of Israel and he said to him, Hey, why don't you go and ask the prophets of your mother and your father? Who was the mother and the father of the king of Israel? Jezebel and Ahab. Remember? And they were, they were killing, I mean, they were, they were fighting against the prophets. And they had all their witches. So he, he actually say, say to them, why you come to me? Go to the prophets of your mom and dad. He was upset. But for the sake of Jehoshaphat, he made a decision. And he says, bring me a musician. <laughs> and he heard from God. Why? His emotions was out of whack. He was upset. He says, but okay, bring me a musician. So he prays. They make music and he prays God. And his emotions calmed down. See, there was a time when I said, we don't need praise and worship in the church. Because I'm different. I'm the whole week in the Word. I'm in God. I spend time with the Lord. For me, I can walk up any time to the, to the pulpit and preach. It's not a problem for me. I don't really need music. Sometimes I do. If someone really upset me just before the meeting or something like that. Are you with me? But, but the reality is that the Father spoke to me. He said to me, Peter, you must remember your people work the whole week. They got full programs. And they, they need praise and worship in the church. It's really important. Because praise and worship brings the emotions down. It brings you to focus on God again. Amen? Yes. Therefore, it's important to go to church. Yes. It's really important because if you go to church, it's a place where you worship. 
Some people come, okay, I'm just going to worship tonight and I'm going to hear what the pastor say. That's a wrong way to come to church. Can I tell you something? If you come to church with this attitude, I'm coming tonight and we're going to worship God and God's going to give me wisdom. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to hear in the spirit. I'm maybe going to get a word for Sarah or a word for John. Are you with me? Or I'm going to get a word for myself in my own situation because I want to bring a difference in my neighborhood. I want to bring a difference in my community. I don't want to live under the pressure of unhealthy emotions anymore. I want my emotions to be healthy emotions full of joy and peace because then I create a different environment in my household, in my community and everywhere. Am I right? It's so true. The second thing that's important, I'm going to go fast. Uh, the second thing is a, is a wrong heart attitude. I want to tell you guys something. Bitterness is a bad thing. People who are in grace, they don't want to hear stuff like this. But let me tell you something. We live in this world. People hurt us. People do things against us. We do things to people. Some stuff happened. Misun people misunderstood you. Can I tell you something? You maybe misunderstood someone. Are you with me? They have a bad day and you think, oh, they got it against me. Can I tell you something? Bitterness got a voice. Fear got a voice. Condemnation got a voice. It speaks to you louder than God in your heart. So forgive people. Live on the grace. If you can't forgive people, say, Jesus, give me the grace to forgive them. I do that all the time. Can I tell you why? I work with people. <laughs> Jesus, listen to this. Jesus never said, I'm going to send you all the amazing, perfect, wonderful people in the community to the church. He never said that. In fact, he sent the outcasts, the bitter people, the broken hearted, yes. the people who stab one another in the back. Some of those who come out of a gossiping background and stuff. They come to the church. They need help. We need to work with them. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yes. And then anything can happen. Yeah. <laughs> John arrived at church. He's always a nice guy. And one day he's the demon manifesting him. You didn't even know he was there. <laughs> And then I had a laugh, I have to tell you this story, can I? Do we have time? Man, I have time. What's the time? You guys want me to go home? Come on. Come on. This friend of mine after church, and he was always into demons. I, oh, I say, I say, if you give something attention, you're going to get attention. I, will, I don't really bother about demons and stuff like that. I don't even preach about it. I don't even preach about the devil. I don't even talk about warfare. I just mentioned tonight a little bit, but... He had people up in the healing line. He is this massive guy in the healing line. And then when he came to pray for this guy, this guy manifest, had a demon in him. And he got him in a head grip. So he got his head in here. The pastor's head. He got him right in here. And the pastor is looking at the congregation. He can't get his head out. The guy got him. And the guy began to shake him around. This, and so the pastor is stuck there. And he began to scream, help! <laughs> in the name of Jesus, this guy. So eventually, they got him loose from the situation. Stuff like that can happen in the church. Did you know that? If I pray for people in, in South America, I never close my eyes. Never. I've seen some stuff happen. This is when church is fun. When the gypsies show up, when you're in, in Europe, believe me, I, every time in Portugal, if I'm there, and the gypsies, they show up in the church, we have manifestations. I don't even have to, because the word just begins to expose that stuff in them. Yeah. They brought the light and the glory in them. And the gypsies, you know, all kinds. Yeah, gypsies, yet yeah. yeah. Anyway, but, but the next day, a lady, next day, a lady phoned that pastor. They say, Pastor, you got the church down the street? He, says, she, she, he said, yeah. He said, you guys drive demons out of people and stuff like that. He said, yeah, we do. He said, did you guys particularly yesterday at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon pass the devil out of somebody? He says, yes, we did. We had such a situation here. She says, well, I want to tell you something. I'm not really a spiritual person, but I've come to the conclusion because we got a horse here on this farm that is a really nice horse. It's a tame horse. The kids play with this horse. But since yesterday afternoon, 3 o'clock, that horse is crazy. He's kicking everything. The foam is coming out of his mouth. He is weak. Nobody can handle it. And he just knew. That devil went into that horse. <laughs> and he arrived there and saw it. And he just said, in the name of Jesus, come out. When he said, the horse fell flat on the ground. And 
after a while, stand up, shake his head, and it was normal again. Oh my! Oh these things is deep. The spirit world is real. Yeah. Well, there's no demons in fine world. <laughs> Wake up, revival! But see, people pray. We bind the devils. We command the devils to leave. Come on, stop praying there. Let them come to the church. I'm honest with you, don't begin to bind the loose devils and stuff like that on a Sunday morning and during the week. Leave it alone. Let them come to the church. They need deliverance, those people. Are you guys with me? This is the honest truth. When I, when I stopped praying in Africa, when God showed me that the demons are still in town and my warfare don't really work much, when I stop that, suddenly we begin to have like every Sunday one or two people in that manifest. People that come out. Because they come, they need help. If you bind the loose and rebuke the devils, and they stay out there. But come on out to church. We want you here someday. Yeah. We're going to have the church service, buddy. We're going to manifest and we're going to cast you out. See, people say that when there's an awakening in the church, it's massive, and the Holy Spirit book is the honest truth. It is massive. That's why I say in the grace move, we can't cut the Holy Spirit out. Well, I'm going to. The third thing, idols. The third thing that I want to give you is idols. You know what? We don't want to hear this stuff, but can I tell you something? If you've got an idol, that idol is going to prevent you from hearing God's voice. <coughs> I want to say to you tonight, enjoy life. Enjoy, go to the sports field, have a team that is, yeah, that is your main team that you support, be a fan of it. Enjoy life, do sport, just enjoy family, everything. But listen, don't make an idol of anything. Right. Amen. Because if you make an idol out of it, it's going to begin to control you. you sometimes that thing is going to drive you that the Holy Spirit can't lead you. Did you know that I... I was I play rugby till the age of 26. Did you know that I was I made rugby an idol after I was when I stopped rugby? Did you know that rugby controlled me so bad that I didn't even sleep on a Saturday night if, uh, on a Friday night if my ten, ten, my, my team spilled to, to play the next morning. I I didn't even sleep. I I was stressed out on it. It controlled me completely. Are you with me? There's so many things in this life that you can just enjoy. Don't make it an idol out of it. Did you know that my wife and my kids is not, is not idols? I love them with my whole heart. They are everything to me. I will kill people, kill people or harm them. But I want to tell you this. They are not idols in my life. They are not standing between me and God. Right. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. I'm not going to let anything in my household interfere with what God said to us. Huh. Are you with me? Yeah. But I love them with my whole heart. I will, I will give my life up for them. You understand what I mean? But I'm not going to let them interfere with what God, what God said to me and what God wants in my life. Right. You have to be careful of idols. People make idols of things. People make idols of fishing. They make idols of anything. <laughs> the third thing that I want to give to you, and this is what I already, I, I already dealt that with you, on, on, on unbelief. You remember when I talked to you about James 5, when he says he is like a wave of the sea. You have to understand that God do not speak unconditionally. Oh, excuse me, God speak unconditionally to you. That means it doesn't matter if you are on or off, He always speaks. Then the last one that I want to give you that is really important, test what you hear. Don't just run off of what you hear. Go to the pastor, go to the leadership of the church. Go to spiritually mature people and say to them, Hey, I heard this from God. I have this vision. Or I have, and I felt like I need to go and do it. But what is your opinion about it? Just pray with me about it. I've seen so many Christians just got a word run off and the timing was out. Yeah. Or something like that. And they run into trouble. God speak to them, the timing is out. Or maybe things are not in place yet. Or they're not supposed to do it alone. Someone else is probably to need to go with them in what they're going to do. And it will end up a disaster. Are you with me? So it's important to test the word. That's why you have leadership. You have pastors in the, pastor in the church. If you go and test the word when you hear something from God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So that's all that I wanted to give you tonight.
I hope it means something. I mean, I was all over the place. But I want to do something now. And I actually want you guys to be involved. I don't want you guys to play music here. I want you to be involved. Yes. We don't need music now. I want you guys to be part of what we're going to do. You can sit there. You don't have to come to the audience. You can sit there. It's fine. Here's what I'm going to tell you we're going to do. Okay, can we do that? Sunday morning a lady was ill. When we did this, do this, and some people with the little of stuff. Okay, now you have to pay attention. First of all, I want to say to you, imagine, how many of you hear the word imagination? We all know that. Imagination is not created by the devil, it's created by God. You've got to understand that. Although, you can use imagination for evil. Amen. But imagination is not supposed to be used for evil. Did you know that Jesus says you have to become like little children? Have you discovered that kids got an amazing imagination? Did you know that the door to visions, visions from God, comes through your imagination? Did you know that? Let me tell you this tonight. If I have to ask Bill to explain to me probably the road back to the hotel, then he will have pictures in his mind of a stop that I have to stop. At that point you turn left, there you go right. There's a house on the corner, pass by. In his, in his mind's eye, in his imagination, he remember that. I as a kid, I can now remember, I'm 54, I can remember the house that I grew up in. And I know exactly how my room used to look in. And I can describe it to you in detail. Even our house on the outside. Did you know that Henry Ford, the guy who had made the Ford car, did you know that Henry Ford, he had, a, he had, a, they had some executives that came there to work, go through his whole company to see what they could do to improve and look at the finances and all kinds of stuff. And on the end of the week, the guy asked him, he says, everything is in order, everything is fantastic what you guys are doing. I've got one problem in your company. You've got one man that is sitting, watching through the window the whole week. He's on payroll here. He come in in the morning, it's 8 o'clock, and he leave 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He do nothing, he just sit and look through the window. What are you doing with that? He said, that guy is the inventor. He sit and imagine the whole week. He said, this is why this company is a success. But, imagination can be out of whack. That's why it's important that you need to test things that you see. Now, always remember, you can imagine anything in this world. You can imagine anything. Now you have to pay attention because I'm going to help you. The moment that Jesus Christ come into your imagination is real. <laughs> because the picture that you're going to get is not something that is coming out of the natural mind. It's something that comes from the spirit of Because the moment that you begin to imagine and you, the moment that you bring Jesus into the picture, the Holy Spirit begins to take over. Are you with me? Okay, now I'm going to help you. <laughs> now I'm going to help you. So now you have to sit down, you have to close your eyes. But before we go on, I have to say this to you. Jesus Christ is dwelling in you. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, right. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have been created in His image, so you are now also a Son of God. Okay? All right? Yes. But Jesus personally wants to spend time with you. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Am I right? Yes. Okay, so I want you to relax now, to close your eyes, and I'm going to lead you into a picture. Okay? And then when you are in that picture, I'm going to take you step by step into the reality. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. All right, so relax, close your eyes, don't say a thing. <laughs> if you don't mind. So first of all, imagine yourself or picture yourself sitting 
on a bench somewhere outside in a place where you like to sit. It can maybe be on the beach. It can maybe be on a beautiful big grass field. It can be in nature, under a tree, it doesn't matter. How many of you as you sit here can picture yourself sitting outside on a tree? Uh, on a bench, how many of you can picture it? We all can do that, it's very simple, it's very easy. All right. Let's take that a little bit further. See yourself, your feet on the ground, maybe on the grass. Go so far that you even feel the grass under your feet. Or the sand. Or whatever it is. Can you imagine that? It's very simple, isn't it? Now feel, feel a wind breeze over you. Imagine in your mind's eye the wind is breezing your hair. You feel a nice cool wind, maybe you sit in a hot place or you sit in a cool place, you feel a hot breeze, it doesn't matter. The next step is you feel the sun shining on you. Feel the heat of it. Or if you sit under a tree, you feel the cool of it. Okay? You got that? You all got that? Okay, now you see someone coming to you in a long in a distance from you. Someone start walk. You see someone walking towards you. Can you imagine something like that? Can you see someone walking towards you? Right. And as you come closer, you see it's Jesus. I feel the presence of God immediately. And now Jesus come and come and sit right next to you. Now I want you to let the Holy Spirit take over. Let the Holy Spirit right now say, Holy Spirit, guide me further in this relationship. What do you see Jesus is doing? What do you see how Jesus looks like? What clothes do we have? Does he smile when he look at you? Does he touch you? Does he say something to you? Now you are. Can I tell you something? If you don't believe me or not, you are in the Spirit now. You are. We are all in the Spirit. What is Jesus saying to you? What is Jesus showing you? Allow me to do that right now. Maybe you have a sickness in your body. Allow him to touch that area that he put his hand on. Maybe you need a word from him. Allow him to speak to you. Maybe you need wisdom. Allow him to show it to you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for revealing things. Thank you for so showing things. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for touching your people. Thank you, Jesus. If you see or hear or feel something, just slip your hand up. Did you see brother right here in front of me, behind me? Let me jump over to that sister there next to me. What's your name, sister? Next to you. <laughs> yes, what did you what did you see? Me? Yeah. <coughs> Jesus, 
Whiskey Brother. Yes. Yeah. Jesus came up and sat down and he opened up a book. And he was showing me stuff. Like, oh. Someone else that wants to share. I don't get peace. Yeah. I see, and I was sitting up on my call in this mountain from Brenda in Noel, you know, where we used to go climb. And I've been there throughout the years once again, but uh, I'm up there, you know, with the dam in my hometown, and, and there's a big cross up on the hill, too. And I, I look over here, I, I'm sitting on a blanket, so that's what I used to do. My toes were touching the grass, I take my shoes off. I look over here, and then here comes Jesus. I thought that before you even said that. And uh, he sits right down beside me. I'm looking, I, I see him, and then I'm looking up at the sky, you know, I'm sitting there looking around. And I'm happy in the wind, you know, cool air, I'm inside. And Jesus is sitting here, and he's looking at me, you know, with such a peace, loving, like you're the apple of my eye, look. And I just said, Lord, I talked with him, and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm glad you walked with me all the years that I was, you know, come from that I, you know, exit or whatever. But I said, but I feel your pain. I know it was my pain all these years, but I feel how you've been with me all the years. How much the pain you had to feel, you know. But I think you. Someday there was a lady there, she said, she was visiting the church for the first time, she's not exposed to stuff.